We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. All right, Dr. Dan, welcome to the show, my friend. Yeah, it's good to be with you, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mate, um, as I said to you uh, before before the show, a lot of the listeners are interested in um, in psychedelic assisted therapy, psychedelic research in general, um, just about, you know, how that's going to change our view of consciousness and, and reality. And, um, you know, but more specifically, um, something that I've been speaking a lot more about on the show and, um, and something that I think uh, a lot of the listeners are quite interested in is, is MDMA. And um, your book, A Dose of Hope, couldn't be more uh, applicable for that. Um, mm-hmm. So, so I mean, a lot of the listeners know who you are. For those who don't, could you give us just a brief um, introduction and, um, and then we can go from there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. My background is in psychiatry and neurology. I have my medical degree from here in the States, um, a couple of fellowships, my last of which was in child and adolescent psychiatry and have run centers in traumatic brain injury recovery, um, published a book a number of years ago called the concussion repair manual. And I think that was uh, a way for me to get into the field of regenerative and restorative medicine, starting with the hardware sciences first, and now expanding into what I would call the software sciences, um, issues around the mind, deep aspects of knowing oneself. We might call that soul. And how do we bring these hardware and software sciences together? Uh, So after running a dozen or so different centers, I'm about to open up my new clinic, Kuya, here in a couple of weeks here in Austin. And it's an institute for transformational medicine where we bring those hardware and software sciences together. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, let's actually briefly talk about the um, concussion repair manual because that's such a... uh, you know, it's such a contentious topic right now. You know, we have a game, um, Australian rules football down here. Um, and a lot of that concussion stuff is a big problem. You know, people getting, um, you know, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, you know, far earlier than they really should. And I know that's really prevalent, um, you know, with the NFL, uh, with, with your national game, or maybe someone could test that, but, um, yeah. What were some of the reasons that compelled you to, to write that, that manual and what were some of the findings? Yeah. Uh, well, you just mentioned, um, you have football in a particular iteration. We have football in a particular iteration and Latin America has football in a particular iteration, (laughs) i.e. soccer. Yeah. So I played soccer for 25 years competitively and, um, then got into a variety of board sports, kind of grew up playing, uh, skateboarding as well. And then got into snowboarding. And um, my last two concussions, uh, the fifth one where I dove off pier, broke my neck, and the sixth one where I got turned upside down in a snowboard park, uh, those significantly created the experience of what many people will note if they've had a lot of really significant concussions called post-concussive syndrome. And basically, you just can't shake the fog. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of other core symptoms light noise sensitivity, mood dysregulation, sleep dysregulation, either hypersomnolence or insomnia, um, problems with executive function, so that'd be con- uh, concentration, focus, mood, attention, being able to shift from one set to another. All of these are the variety of different psychological and neurological implications that happen after a series of stacked head injuries. And <laughs> about this is close to 20 years now when I had my sixth Mm. and my PCS post concussive syndrome started getting really bad. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of treatment. Uh, PCS really wasn't appreciated back then. It was barely talked about in research trials, but not, not much done or appreciated clinically. Mm. So I started just having severe, um, narcolepsy which is a sleep disorder, um, severe um, trouble with 
just my memory, short-term focus, being able to put what I just read, learned into long-term memory and retrieval. And there weren't a whole lot of treatments. So I put myself in the laboratory and over the course of about 15 years, spent close to a half a million dollars and, and a lot of time, energy, and just curiosity of what was going to work well. Yeah. And um, eventually healed that, uh, thankfully, uh, with a variety of different tools, some of which were psychedelic therapeutics as well. That's a, kind of another part of the story. And then um, was working with a company that you mentioned earlier, Aubrey and Onnit, uh, also here in Austin. And Ob and I have been friends for a while, and I started working with some of their team and a lot of people in our mutual circle, combat fighters, uh, veterans, uh, people like myself who had played a variety of different sports. Soccer is not necessarily considered a combat sport, but the way I played in the position I played in, there was a lot of heading the ball. Yes. And I didn't, I didn't know at that time that if you take a full volley punt, like, cause I played defense center back. If you take a full volley punt from the opposite team's goalkeeper, and that's about a 60, 70 yard punt, so to speak. And you take that full on in the head, that's about an 80 pound uh, per square inch shock to the brain mm. versus getting slugged in a fight. Like typically with seven ounce, nine ounce gloves, which a lot of different fighters will spar with, you get hit like that and it's about 30 pounds mm, wow. per square inch. So like two to three times that, but we didn't know that. No. The soccer players are like, oh, you're just heading the ball. That's, I mean, there's like no damage, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and we grew up that way too, right? Oh, you're not bleeding, so you might as well just get back out on the field. Tape right. it. If something hurts, tape it up. If it still hurts, tape it tighter <laughs> and worry yep. about it later. Tape the tape. <laughs> Totally. That's how I grew up. That's probably how you grew up. That's how a lot of us grew up. That's how we, that's how little we knew of the long-term implications of that kind of um, head injury exposure over a long period of time. And yeah. so you're alluding to the early dementia that we now call chronic traumatic encephalopathy, T CTE, that happens with football, American football, football in a variety of different sports, a variety of different countries. Um, you, and, and so it's unfortunate and we'll make the corollary and the switch over to psychedelics. Over the last 30 years, we haven't known so much about the long-term implications of head injury, right? So now we're seeing early dementia. Mm. We also, over the last 30 to 40 years, have had this lull in this hiatus in psychedelic research and we haven't really appreciated the long-term implications of psychological trauma. So it's fascinating how both the fields of neurology and psychiatry, i.e. psychology, depends on if you have an MD or a PhD, and you know how you look kind of through, the, through that lens, mm. but we're seeing the long-term implications of trauma, whether it's a brain injury or a mind injury. So it doesn't seem coincidental to me that both of these fields that have historically been really pessimistic, neurology and psychiatry, it's like, okay, we can diagnose you, but we have marginal therapeutics. In psychiatry, you have depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, pain. Great. We've got talk therapy. We mm. have uh, psychopharmaceuticals. And not to make either of those wrong, um, it significantly helps to have a therapist that um, believes in a person and holds a safe container to have that person get to know themselves better. Um, and it can help to have psychopharmaceuticals online, especially in acute, really severe symptomatology. It's, and, and even more so if that's all that person has as the primary tool. So if somebody's standing mm. on the ledge and they have access to pharmaceuticals, I'm going to say take the pharmaceuticals. Yes but ideally only doing that while we're looking at the underlying cause and the underlying issues, because medications are not designed to fix the core issue. Mm -hmm. They're ideally setting a safe space, particularly if somebody's acutely symptomatic and they can't take care of themselves well, they're not able to function in their life well, or they're not able to take care and take um, their own safety needs or they're, they're dangerous potentially to themselves or other people. 
that's where we in acute care, ER, OR, triage care management as an allopathic Western medical system, we're really good in acute care management. Mm. But we're really shitty in preventative care and chronic care management. So we're seeing this massive revolution in these two primary fields and psychedelic therapies are phenomenal because they're really positioned between both of those psychedelic therapies when done well are very much a psychological aid as well as a neurological aid. Mm. Like for example, we've seen early great results with ketamine therapy for traumatic brain injury with psilocybin therapy for traumatic brain injury. My story includes ayahuasca for traumatic brain injury. I saw, uh, and then I'll wrap it up and give you back the talking stick because I've been jabbing for a while. No, I love it. I love it. I, in the mid, right before, right, no, it was right after I wrote the concussion repair manual. Um, and I was getting courted by uh, a particular TBI center uh, who has a national reputation and I respect quite highly. And um, the lead of that organization, after he looked at my SPECT scan, which is a unique kind of brain scan, it kind of turns your brain into a cartoon. Um, and it's more of a functional assessment than it is an anatomical assessment. So okay. like if you have glucose down regulation because of a really significant injury, you would see that look like a hole in the brain. Thankfully, it's not an anatomic hole, but it looks like mouse just took a big bite out of Swiss cheese. And you're like, holy <laughs> shit, that's really intense. Yeah. And he looked at my scan and he goes, wow, man, I've seen about 14,000 brain scans and I've never seen one look as bad as yours. Wow. Function as well as yours. Oh, wow. And I was like, I, could, I think that's a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds compliment. both scary and optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> true, and, true. And finally, you know, he's he kind of wrapped it around and he said, so what have you been doing? Because it's clear you've had severe injuries, but it's clear you have pretty significantly uh, beneficial compensatory mechanisms. And I said, well, you know, I've done a lot of different things. I, I, I put myself in the lab. I've written this book. I actually train others. And he knew a little bit about my backstory, but he didn't know this piece. And I said, you know, if there was one thing that I could point to that I think that was the most significant besides stem cells, besides hyperbarics, besides you know, you can go down the list, targeted nutraceuticals, flotation therapy. Uh, the list is deep about all these different, you know, treatment options, stackable therapies. But if there was one thing that I point to that when I experience it, it feels like it turns my brain on like a Christmas tree. That's ayahuasca. Wow. And he said, cool, man, tell me more about that. And, and this was still seven years ago when when Aya was kind of coming on to the, the map and the radar, so to speak, my entry into psychedelic therapy was about 15 years ago uh, in an underground ayahuasca circle. Mm. And it was the first time I felt like my brain actually came on. And so I was enamored. I closed up my clinic and moved out of the jungle and I lived there for a year. <laughs> that, studying, that makes a lot of sense. With, studying with the teachers because I really wanted an under, and I was kind of, I was really stoked, super inspired by what just happened. But I was also a bit pissed off that we know so little about this tool and technology in our medical care system. And we've made psychedelic therapies, at least in my lifetime that I can remember bastardized, you know, mm -hmm. this whole war on drugs. This is your brain on fried eggs, even cannabis. Cannabis is an amazing neurorehabilitative tool unless we use it too much because every medicine has its sweet spot, right? If mm -hmm. you don't use enough, there's no effect. If you use too much, it's poison. And so once I realized, and, and I'm not making a broad scope recommendation for people to go experience ayahuasca. Um, number one, not everybody's ready. Number two, it's a big experience. And number three, it's highly endangered right now because oh, it's being overly harvested more than we are planting. Mm. And that's, a, that's part of our choice. And that's part of our responsibility to make thoughtful choices. So when we get into things like MDMA, ketamine, LSD, they're synthetic, reproducible in the lab, great. Psilocybin grows very fast. You can grow it in your closet. I have friends that are pretty good amateur mycologists. <laughs> and, you know, so you can, you can crack that code at home. Um, 
Uh, San Pedro cactus grows pretty quick as far as cactuses go. Um, but peyote, iboga, ayahuasca, we could also put the Sonoran desert toad. Yeah. Um, that's an endangered species, 5 amino DMT. I mean, there are medicines that are being extracted at highly aggressive rates. So part of our due diligence and responsibility is to make sure that we're holding that in a good way and also giving back to the communities where these medicines come from. Mm. So that was a long circuitous answer to your question as far as like, you know, my backstory goes. It's perfect. It's perfect. Um, And, you know, one of the reasons why I I love to have, you know, people like yourself riffing first is because just questions are just coming. You know, I just, there's so many questions I want to, I want to ask. I suppose that the, 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 the one that um, sticks to mind first was, a, what compelled you to try ayahuasca um, in the beginning? Because that was a long time ago. You know, now it's as 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 you kind of alluded to, it, it's much more common for people to say. You know, I used to be a CrossFit coach before I became a a counselor, and um, I remember coaching someone who's saying, "Oh, you know, I'm looking forward to trying ayahuasca." Now that that was 2017, so that was pretty common. You know, but back when you gave it a crack, it's it was very mm-hmm. very uncommon. So, a a what compelled you to to try it, and then b was it you know being a scientist yourself. Was it the science? Was it the changes in your brain that that most intrigued you, or was it the subjective experience and the the um, the trauma reconciliation that that made you really think, okay, there's something to this ayahuasca? Mm. Yeah, great question. I appreciate how you worded that question because um, it also helps me understand your thoughtfulness and how much you understand about the the differential between the the rational investigation mm. the scientific investigation and the subject experiential investigation yeah yeah and i'm historically not much of a research scientist um i tend to be a, a more of an adventure seeker and, and more of an experiential engineer uh, i kind of found my way into medicine just happenstance you know i went to college to play soccer here in austin uh, and I have, hey, I was going to say, sorry to cut you off. You were the captain. Yeah. But yeah. 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 You, you, you modestly disregarded that point. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, I, it was, it feels like a different lifetime ago. Yeah. Um, because in high school and college, I was just super aggressive. I was standing on the gas pedal 4.0 captain of the team, academic all American, like everything was just full throttle. And I'd give a shit about you if you're in my way, you know, yeah. especially if you're on the other team. <laughs> That's kind of why I played the position that I played in, not because I was very big, but because most center backs, you have to have a bit of size. I was just scrappy, hungry, aggressive, intense. And hence, uh, you know, half a dozen pretty severe concussions and a variety of other, you know, injuries to to have a little bit of a map of some of the memories. Um, You know, but in that kind of aggression, the first aha moment for me was when I broke my neck because mm. uh, I was going to go, I matched back in San Antonio because I'm, I'm between Austin and San Antonio. Uh, and I was going to go into ER medicine or surgical care. And two weeks before medical school, I dove off a pier, uh, landed on my crown, broke C5, ended up in a halo, one of those things screwed into your skull for th- three months. And it really slowed me down. It was the first thing that slowed me down and help me just pause a little bit and reflect like who who am i trying to impress whose expectations am i living up to are these my choices like you know really consciously pausing just enough to reflect a bit and then also at that time a friend of mine introduced me to cannabis and I had my first marijuana experience and prior to that i was like you know, I'm not going to ever smoke dope because my brain's going to turn like a fried egg, just like the commercial. Yeah. I don't want to end up in a stupid puddle for the rest of my life. Um, but I was having a bit of what, learning gross anatomy and, and first semester pathology and like memorizing phone books of information with this thing screwed into my skull. It was mm. given, it was a bit hard to manage and give me some headaches. And uh, I was, you know, a friend of mine just said, Hey, you probably need to get good sleep. And I, my sleep was shit because I was up all night with these, you know, pin aches. And, um, I tried a toke and it 
opened up all the doors of perception and mm-hmm. all of that judgment and all of that um, contraction and limited dogma, limited belief dogma started to fall away. And I realized mm-hmm. like, well, shit, that's a long held belief that no longer applies. What are other long held beliefs that no longer apply? Yeah. And so I started doing a lot of self-reflection and that eventually took me into psychiatry. Uh, uh, there were a bunch of other experiences. I thought I was going to go into pediatrics and in an ICU, just watching little kids die. Like, that was a big wake up call. Mm. And, and it was also the, the evolution of like me just trying on these different fields of medicine and finally psychiatry and given my head injury background, neurology sounded like it seemed like a good fit. And so I was practicing once I finished all my training, I was practicing in integrative psychiatry. Um, and back then that was kind of novel too, because we're not taught as psychiatrists how to help people get off of medications. We're taught how to add and add and add and add more and keep doing the same thing, monkeying with these little neuroreceptors through these exogenous influences that have a significant change in the internal state. And and people do habituate to the medications. So then you have to increase the dose and people get side effects. Mm. And it's it was very unfulfilling. But when I started learning from chiropractors, naturopaths, um, Eastern medicine docs, Ayurveda, I had a lot of different teachers and a lot of different traditions because I just wanted to understand what are what's everybody saying about mental health from these different lenses. And in the midst of that, I was also... Uh, so I was in my practice for about a year, year and a half, and I was going through a separation and a divorce and I couldn't feel it. And, um, I knew I didn't want to live like that. There was just a plate of armor around my heart. So I made it, made a big prayer, uh, in a sweat lodge, you know, help me open up my heart. And, uh, about a month later, a friend of mine introduced me to ayahuasca circle. He said, I heard your prayer in the lodge and, um, I think this might help you. And he had been a part of the circle for like a year. He's now one of my best friends. Um, and we were just getting to know each other back then. And But there was something in the way he introduced it, like invited me into it. I trusted him a lot. And I didn't research anything. I didn't know anything. No, I mean, I like you mentioned, this was a while back. No one was really yeah. talking about ayahuasca. But man, in that first weekend, it was revolutionary. I still remember it like it was yesterday how much happened in, in, in what felt like my brain literally turning on in ways that had never happened in my mind, in my body, uh, a reconnection to the, the natural world, a reconnection to my ancestors, my teachers, my guides, like so much happened. And basically I just wanted to know more. I wanted to really understand the beautiful complexities and nuances of this medicine. And I was already in the midst of this kind of transitionary phase in my life. Um, so I left Portland, ended up living in an ashram for a couple of years. Oh, cool. I, yeah, it was a great experience. I was pretty hardcore Buddhist at the time. And then I went into this ashram where the, it was more based in Kabbalistic tradition. Um, but I also re- realized that I don't think I, I was yet ready to go all the way down South and do the deep dive ayahuasca apprenticeship. And so after a couple of years, I was more and more like getting the call mm. and, uh, and went and tucked away uh, for a good spell just with the plants. You know, I'm, I had a predominant primary teacher, um, but my Spanish was really lousy and his English was zero. So <laughs> we didn't talk. <laughs> That'd <much>. be fun. <laughs> and, and, Every time I asked him a question, he just said, go ask the plants. And I was like, all right, cool. Is that, we lost some uh, translation? He'd already actually talked to the plants. <laughs> Check. <laughs> okay. Ah, that's yeah. so cool. That's great. Um, yeah, no, I suppose um, one of the reasons I'm always interested, um, you know, in that, you know, because you're, you're really at the conjunction, you know, you, you understand the, the, the science and, 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 you know, they understand the, the brain and the microanatomy, the macro neuroanatomy. Um, but you've also got these incredible subjective experiences. And um, there are so many people out there who perhaps maybe aren't 
fully into this um, psychedelic revolution yet um, for what, for whatever reason, and they still require the science. Um, but it's, I just think it's always an interesting question to ask because once you've had a transformative or a, a mystical experience, I suppose, clinically, the science almost becomes irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. I kind of, <clears throat> in some ways did it the other way around. This the experience drew me into a desire to understand the science. Yeah. And um, there's a really cool guy named Stan Groff. I don't know if you know that name. Mm-hmm. He's kind of one of the godfathers of, of this movement. Uh, and is probably single-handedly done, facilitated and supervised more LSD therapy sessions than anybody else on the planet. And he's fond of saying that, you know, part of our challenge in our current religious paradigm is that it's an intellectual pursuit. It's not an, it's not an experiential spirituality. Mm. And with something like a psychedelic process to really get us in touch with the deeper aspects of ourself. Now that experiential connection with divinity, with source consciousness, with the sacred, whatever that is for each of us and whatever context and language and culture that gets imbued through it's that getting in touch with the sacred that helps us reclaim a, a deep part of our essence that we in our very fast paced society, especially in the medical arena have divorced ourselves from like my training. You couldn't even talk about spirituality. I'm like, well, aren't we a mind based scientific body here? Like doesn't yeah. psyche mean mind and doesn't, doesn't it also translate to soul? Yes. Right? Shouldn't we be asking these questions about spiritual? That was not even in the in the cards, but with something like psychedelic therapy, which very much brings that sacred essence online, it's hard to unsee what you just saw. It's hard to to forget the feeling of getting in touch with a a true part of life and perhaps what makes life meaningful at the core of our being. It's hard to forget that. When you go through an experience. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I sometimes wonder, um, you know, when, when things are really meant to be, you know, you look at the the change now and, you, you know, people are talking about, um, you know, uh, this deep sense of knowing, as you mentioned, this, this connection to the fundamental essence and, um, and all these incredibly profound um, changes, positive changes that these people are having. And you have to wonder after so many decades, you know, what, what life was like when we didn't view that as, as deeply, deeply important to the field of Mm. not only medicine and mental health, but, but everything, you know, the whole reason, um, I've always been interested in this kind of thing. And, you know, my first memory is, you know, looking in my, looking at my hands. Um, I just went to the toilet. I was, um, I was with my mates, um, playing on the trampoline in the backyard. It was about 10 or something. I, I had this kind of moment of um, uh, presence. So I can't remember how old I was, but I remember looking at my hands and be, becoming in, uh, incredibly terrified because I was just like, how did I get in here? You know, I was really, I didn't understand that, that mind body uh, dichotomy. And I think my whole life has been kind of, you know, this fascination and pursuit of trying to understand reality. And I think for whatever reason, you know, without being too biased that, people's actions and all this kind of, you know, if, if we all kind of stopped and paused for long enough, we'd all start to really find those questions, you know, not only very important, but perhaps the most important because at the end of the day, all we know is that we don't really know a lot and psychedelics seem to be um, changing at least a tiny portion of our understanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well said. Totally agreed. Um unfortunately our our educational system i don't know about your educational system but at least in the states our educational system is not set up around these conversations and particularly the opportunity to ask kids these kinds of questions because kids are more tapped in yes they have they haven't forgotten so much they haven't gotten so armored and locked into like the system or the 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 level of external expectation and and trying to you know, fit themselves into somebody else's box. It starts happening in childhood for sure, but they're still open. And how glorious to be able to engage that conversation at that place. Mm. Um, 
but you have to ask, you have to ask somebody who can ask that question and you can actually engage the conversation and most teachers are are taught the same kind of avoidance don't bring spirituality in the classroom don't re- don't bring religion into the laboratory you know we have these these just such strong divisions between different aspects of our life and that by itself starts to teach us to divide ourselves mm. into these different silos like oh here's my work life here's my here's my relational life here's my play life here's my family life here's my community life versus having a greater experience of integration you know so we're just talking about different reductionistic models education is a very reductionistic model the way medicine has been practiced is a very reductionistic model the way we extract our food from the land in commercial agriculture is a very reductionistic extractive culture and so what we're talking about is moving towards a level of integration mm. and holism and that experience where we can as as parents offer that to our children or we can create the community infrastructure that when you're going through this experience at 10 and you have this like aha moment i wonder if it made it changed or shifted if you knew that you had a safe adult mentor guide elder that you could talk to Mm. talk with this about um or or somebody that's asking those kinds of questions do you ever wonder how you got here yeah do you ever wonder where you were before you were here (laughs) yeah you know just see what little kids have to think about these things those are the same kind of questions that we start asking in psychedelic states. <laughs> so <true. laughs> kind of by default, yeah. <laughs> hopefully before we exit this monkey suit and we, and we regret not having asked the question, not looking deeply into the dark mirror, into the you know experience and essence of who we are. Mm, yeah. Oh, mate, absolutely. Um, you know, and I think it's, that's a great segue, um, to now talk about your latest book, uh, A Dose of Hope. Um, I did not expect this to be a fictionalized narrative, a novel. Um, that's really cool. What, what compelled you to write a, a novel? You know, I, it's oftentimes very dry for me to just read science. I, again, I'm more of an experiential engineer than I'm a research scientist. I, I do geek out on the research predominantly because I want to understand it more deeply on my side and therefore support the creation of better therapeutic protocols and to be able to also speak to the scientific community so they don't think I'm just some knucklehead yahoo a couple of brain traumas, concussion. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> oh, that's oh, just wow, Dr. Dan. He's <laughs> showing. Or somebody that's chasing the high or like, you know, I'm, I'm a psychedelic advocate just for like the civil rights and renaissance mm-hmm. of the movement. It's like, yes, that's all true. And uh, I think that we have an opportunity to actually change the entire field of medicine and healthcare. Mm. So my desire is to support policy change and therefore I need to know the science in order to do that. But by itself, (laughs) data and science can seem kind of dry. So I wanted to offer people an engaging uh, narrative. My co-author and I, we chose to do that. Um, as opposed to just being dry science and like, here are some pearls that you need to know if you're going to go through a, an experience or a process, mm-hmm. like let's embed it into an, enga- an engaging storyline and put the, just like with kids, you know, it's coming back to kids. It's like hiding the, the, the peas under the mashed potatoes, yes. <laughs> hiding the, the, the little wisdom pearls underneath the engaging narrative so that people could find connection in, in, commonality with the protagonist with Alex Mm. and also describe it in a story that's more normalized. That's more relatable to the average. It's not like Alex is a veteran coming out of Afghanistan. Yeah. And has classic PTSD. Alex just relatively normal dude asking relatively common questions and having a limited experience in his ability to express fulfillment in his life mm. stemming from early adverse childhood experiences that we would call the adult expression of 
complex PTSD versus classic PTSD. Mm. So that's an example of how we're understanding more and more about trauma. And it doesn't have to be that you were exposed in a war environment or a motor vehicle accident where you, you know, got thrown through the windshield or that you got assaulted by a team of people that you didn't know, or, you know, all these like really severe traumas where you thought you were going to die. That's more classic PTSD when you have the recurrence experiencing of those um, traumas and therefore the symptoms are severe. We call that classic PTSD. Complex PTSD is more like a series of really shitty things that happen to you when you're a little person, Mm -hmm. a little boy, a little girl. They don't have to be like overtly sexualized or like physical abuse. It might have been emotional neglect, Mm. rejection, abandonment, betrayal, humiliation. These things that set up as core wounds that encode into the mind and into the psyche and even into the neurology itself, a similar traumatized pattern that expresses itself as this limitation that's guarding these ego defenses that try consistently to keep ourselves safe from re-experience as adults from re-experiencing the same trauma that we experience as children Mm. so this is more of the comp complex ptsd kind of iteration both of those can still lead to the same outcomes like addiction depression other um challenging, self-sabotaging behaviors, other ways to numb the pain, right? Because we're we're meaning-making machines and we're novel-seeking and we'll figure out ways to arrest or significantly depress our um, suffering, whether mm-hmm. it's physical pain or emotional pain. And so sometimes that looks like addiction, but addiction is not the problem. Like Gabor Mate says... Addiction is just the solution. The problem is the trauma underlying it. So all of, and then we get in and we start looking at, okay, well, what's the best treatment for trauma? MDMA. It's, it's when you look at the data, it's the single best treatment that we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Psychedelic therapies are good also as a, as a umbrella term that includes a lot of different medicines um, but the therapeutic use of these tools, particularly MDMA, is very good for trauma. And when when we're looking at kind of out at the landscape of how many people are traumatized, yeah. And like Alex, he didn't really know there was much trauma there under the until he got under the hood in a medicine experience and started recovering all of these memories and the intensity of of those memories as it affected him as an adult and had the safe supportive environment to work it through. So we kind of wanted to just show in a narrative that was engaging a relatively normal person who had relatively normal trauma, who went through a massive healing experience and what were all the right conditions and the set, the mindset and the setting, the physical environment for that healing to happen. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's one of the reasons why I'm really, really enjoying it. Um, you know, it's because of that, the way that you've written it, the way that it normalizes, um, you know, not only the extremes and I, I suppose, you know, um, maybe in some way we had to begin with the extremes because they were, you know, the people that were probably most subject to suicidal ideation or, or, or serious long-term issues or whatever it is. But, you know, now we live in a world and myself as a counselor where I'll have clients who, uh, you know, because they, they still are intertwined with that kind of classic model of trauma that they experience and hold on to a lot of shame around the experiences of their own subjective childhood, because, you know, well, that's not traumatic. So I should just harden up or whatever it is, you know, and that okay. shame is, is the, is the, <laughs> so that's, in my opinion, anyway, it's the hardest thing I have to kind of punch through with them so that we can get to the healing, you know, and, and, you know, to, I suppose to just um, bounce off what you were talking about with trauma, uh, my friend, she's a psychotherapist and she says that, you know, the, the definition of which the way she sees trauma is kind of any experience or event that uh, in which you were rendered helpless, that left to a negative belief about yourself. And, you know, when I say that to, to people, it's a great way that's like, no matter who you are, no matter what you've been through, whether it's 
bombings in, in a war or, as you said, avoidance, neglect, disregard, um, you kind of fit that definition. That's a great definition. If I was to quote your friend, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what's her name? Yeah, Heidi Rogers. She's fantastic. She's from LA originally, I think. Um, cool. But uh, she works as a psychotherapist down here in, in Melbourne, Australia, and um, she's fantastic. She um, she she's really big on you know understanding the differences between shame and guilt and and helping people kind of narrativize their lives. Um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to send her this now. I think. <laughs> yeah, totally. We're giving Heidi yes. Rogers the shout out. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I, I love that mm-hmm. definition. It really encapsulates it, uh, and it helps to normalize it because we've all been through really intense experiences where we did feel helpless, and the downstream effect was the creation of some kind of negative self belief and some kind of negative internal attitude towards ourself or towards life. Mm. Like life's not safe, right? I've got to stay guarded. Um, I'm not worthy of love or love's not safe because perhaps we have this experience of what love looked like from our primary caregivers. And maybe that wasn't unconditional. Maybe, maybe love was expressed, expressed with conditionality, Mm. And then love has this really kind of twisted um, uh, give and take kind of relationship. I have some ambivalence. I know that I want it, but maybe it's not safe. And then it comes with pain. And then like, I, I you know, it creates all this just craziness in the mind. Mm. And when we just distill it down to those few topics, those few core um, imperatives that we experience a negative event where we're helpless and that creates a negative belief system that incorporates quite a bit of it. And, and, and I would also include in there and we don't have the coping strategies. Yeah. We weren't modeled the coping strategies. Um, we weren't offered those. We didn't know they were possible. We didn't know you know, that we didn't have the understanding of how to do it differently Mm. and how many people do you think that that makes up in our current very fast paced culture? <laughs> a lot. All of us. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You know, and I do have some friends that grew up with amazing parents and they, they can still point to things that were uncomfortable. I, I mean, I think that's part of being in the monkey suit Yeah, is that life is school and we're going to learn through our challenges and, Oh yeah, by the way, our challenges are typically our best teachers. And so how do we, how do we bring those traumatized parts of ourself, those split off parts of the self, Mm. particularly if we're looking at like parts work, internal family systems kind of work. How do we bring those parts of ourself back home that, that are filled with shame and guilt and unresolved rage at the experience or self-doubt self-incrimination um, or confusion. Like, wow, this person, I thought this person, this is the most important person in my life and they're really mean to me right now. Like, wow, why is that? And that must be, I'm really shitty, mm. you know, because oftentimes we kind of make everything about us when we're at that age. Hopefully we grow out of that tendency. I'm not so sure in our culture if we've really done that. <laughs> Uh, you know, but we can just see how it gets pretty normalized. And, and then I just give massive kudos and gratitude and homage and respect humbly to my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents, because they were just doing the best they knew how to do. Yeah. And they, they, they did the best that they could do given the situation and their tools mm. You know, so we have this now, this growing ability to what I would describe as the privilege to heal. Mm -hmm. We have the privilege to experience these medicines where the the previous generations either didn't have exposure or or there was this crazy mixed media message around the war on drugs and safety and or the benefit. So we're we're accelerating our understanding and appreciation in this arena. And thankfully we've got tools now available and coming more and more available. And that's another reason why I wrote the book because I wanted people to know that there are tools available. Uh, My oldest sister 
uh, about nine years ago, committed suicide uh, mm. from depression and addiction, largely related to her own PTSD. And um, I didn't know then what I know now. And so part of this writing of the book is for people suffering in silence to know that there are treatments coming available and that will be legal relatively soon, hopefully sooner rather than later. So it's up to each of us to do our due diligence and get the good word out to really demand legalization of these therapeutics. Mm. In between now and then, if people are having to hold out while they're suffering in silence, may they know, and this be a dose of hope, may they know and they have hope that um, these treatments can potentially support them. Yeah, I um, I never I never heard uh, it said like that. The the privilege of healing. I think that's um, a really great way of looking at it too, because it it, it shines a light of uh, compassion. You know, as you mentioned for you know, our parents and, and their parents as well. Um, because I think the first thing that can happen, I suppose, is when we start looking back on our childhoods, you know, re, you know, resentment that's been hard, that it's been harbored for so long or whatever it is, as you said, re- repressed rage can come out. And it's just like um, having that, that recognition that, you know, if our, our species as a whole has been in survival mode for so long, generations and generations, generations, just to get us to here and now, the fact that we can heal is a, is an incredible, it just uh, kind of filled me with an incredible sense of gratitude. Um, as you mentioned that for, you know, for my own parents, as well as, you know, your parents and, and parents around the world. So I, I really appreciate mate. You, you said that. Um, I wanted to ask as well, what, so you began with, with, with ayahuasca. How did, how did MDMA come into your life? Uh, it happened after Trudy died. Yeah. 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 Prior to that, um, I was working with only ayahuasca and I had been working with Aya for six, seven years at that point was still very much met, married to the medicine path was raw vegan, <laughs> very yeah. just monastic, low profile, very under the radar. Um, I had a part-time, uh, medical directorship roles, with a few different centers in Sedona and I was just tucked in Sedona. Um, yeah. And then she died. And it was so sudden. Mm. I didn't know that was coming. She'd been made sober 14 months and our, our family didn't see it coming. It was just such a shock. And there was a big fucking wake up. Yeah. And I realized like, geez, man, we have tools. I know we have tools uh, and I need to know what else is available. Cause I was, it was pretty clear to me that ayahuasca legalization wasn't the right answer because the demand uh, for therapeutic services to treat the cult, the, the scale of collective trauma will vastly surpass the amount of ayahuasca that we have. <laughs> yeah. And so I wanted to study the other medicines and, and she was really suffering a lot with addiction so that sent me to Iboga and uh, sat with Iboga a number of times, powerful, beautiful medicine, and then was invited to medically direct an Ibogaine center in Mexico. Uh, and that kind of started to get me back out into the world a bit and worked with Ibogaine a bit and then just kind of worked my way through the progression of other medicines um, just to understand how each of them work. You know, that's it's a part of the field of psychiatry is most psychiatrists would not recommend prescribing these pharmaceuticals to, uh, to their own family or, or to themselves or would want to take them themselves mm. where, but it's okay for us to prescribe these to our clients, like their M and M's. Right. So we have a tendency to not use or even know the experience of the things that we're recommending. Again, it's a, it's a bit of a divorce from an experiential process. So I've been pretty deep down the rabbit hole with a number of different medicines and a number of different contexts and a number of different ceremonies. And I think that's an asset that I can actually speak to friends, family, clients, yourself, and Mm. be a part of the education advocacy community for these tools because they have their place and they also have their dangers. And they also, there's a right way to work with medicines and there's a not so right way or a more haphazard or more dangerous or more careless way. And last thing we need to do is give the doubters and skeptics any more ammunition. 
yeah. to say that we're not ready for legalization. So it's all up to us to be responsible um, stewards of these medicines, particularly for working with them in the underground setting. And then if we know the benefit, then we should be demanding the acceleration of the legalization because there are, at least in the United States, 120 to 130 people that commit suicide every day. And those are the only ones that we're, that we know about. It could easily be double that. And so literally people are dying on the streets in isolation, suffering. And so I gradually worked my way through the medicines after Iboga, psilocybin, and then uh, San Pedro and the cactuses and the mescaline based medicines. And then eventually MDMA. And then when I was looking at, okay, where does MDMA fit in this kind of rubric, this hierarchy of medicines, you have level one medicines, level two, level three. And part of our growing wisdom in this field as a scientific community is developing the alchemy for understanding which medicine to use for which person at what given time in the context of everything else that they're doing. That's more of the alchemy and the art of it mm. versus just saying like, okay, from a scientific perspective, you have depression. Everybody gets Zoloft first. Yes. You fail Zoloft, then you go to Wellbutrin. Or maybe you have like depression and problems with attention. Then you get Wellbutrin. Like, it's not that easy. Mm. And medicine work is not that easy. So it's part of us to develop the, the art of that um, onboarding process. And once I started studying MDMA more closely and looking at the data, it was just so clear, like, wow, what a phenomenal molecule. And if we use it well, uh, in the right way, particularly if people are needing to transition off of psychiatric medications in order to experience it, because that's a clear contraindication, then how do we do that well? Mm. And there are very few psychiatrists that even know how to do that well. I'd say the vast majority of people that I've seen do that well are actually not psychiatrists because we're trained to not get people off of their medications. Mm, wow. I, I study with a lot of naturopaths, detoxification specialists, I've ran detox centers for this work. And, and it's, and it, it can be a bit of a nuance, um, particularly if depending on the medication a person's weaning off of. So anyway, this has just gotten me into kind of the laboratory and the yeah. appreciation that, man, this it's such an amazing medicine and it's pretty freaking forgiving. Like people can have a pretty amazing time if you just create the safe space and like get out of the way. Um, and if there's significant trauma, this is when and why it's so important for people in the facilitation role to know how to work with trauma recovery and to support people going through that process that's why MDMA as a therapeutic tool is so good. It's not because it's used in isolation. These aren't people just hanging out at home, having their own trip. It's because they're actually facilitated with very excellent psychotherapists who have a particularly yeah. strong skill set in trauma recovery. And you lace those two together. Yeah, I, I often wondered uh, what it would be like, you know, to just you know, obviously um, SSRIs are a little bit different to, to MDMA and, and, but, but, you know, you mentioned before set and setting and just the, the absolute importance of, of set and setting. And I often wonder what it would be like now, you know, um, playing around with this stuff myself, just, just, to, you know, a psychiatrist giving, giving a client SSRIs and then just holding that, you know, safe container, as you mentioned and say, oh, so as, as the drug starts to take to effect, you know, how that would kind of change the healing therapy, because, you know, you, you, there's only so many books about psychedelics and, and podcasts you listen to before you have a look at the, the conventional model and go, man, we're, we're off here. <laughs> uh, right. Right. I think that's such a good point. And I, I firmly believe that it's not a matter of if psychedelic therapies are going to become legal. It's just a matter of how and when, mm. because the data is so good. And there's been a fair bit of pushback. Um, some of that potentially for a secondary reason because the pharmaceutical industry is threatened at losing a significant part of their market share. And let's also recognize that there's a ton of medicine coming into the psychedelic research space 
with many people who are not using a much different medical model than the existing pharmaceutical model. Yeah, we have better tools. Like ketamine's better than Zoloft. It's more effective, has less side effects, works quicker. Those are all good efficacy measures, but it's still a medicating, particularly with that, it's a dissociative anesthetic. So it's mm. designed to help you feel less of your symptoms. That's what it does at, by nature. Now, if you lace it with psychotherapy, then there's there's certainly more room to work in that space. But by nature, the way it works phenomenologically is to give a distance between the experience of suffering of those symptoms. Symptoms are just information. It's just letting us know that something's out of balance. Mm. Symptoms are evolutionarily advantageous. Nature doesn't just screw things up for no reason. Mm. We're constantly looking, nature's constantly evolving. Yes, we'll have genetic malformations and genetic expressions and kind of like the genetic roulette wheel because nature's just wondering like, oh, what if we tweak these genes? Like, what's the outcome? Well, that could mean like some awesome new environmentally adaptive trait, or it could mean the opposite and something that those those genes do not propagate. So everything in the you know, known universe is consistently evolving. Mm. We are consistently evolving, thank goodness. Yeah. Like, you know, what, what's true for me and you now is probably different than it was 20 years ago when we were young knuckleheads. Yeah. And so thankfully we're consistently learning and growing. And so it's important to recognize that when symptoms are present, if we have a safe container to investigate it, oftentimes that can tell us where there's a wobble in the system. Mm. Is something off physiologically? If something is off psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, like let's follow that thread versus just continuing to medicate the symptom. And so this is part of the the benefit of creating a new medical model or at least an enhanced and evolved medical model we don't have to totally discard what's been not necessarily talking about complete revolution but i am talking about an accelerated evolution an evolution of our medical system that we're particularly in the field of psychiatry we're looking at reclaiming the core wound not suppressing it and this is the, the bifurcation or one of several bifurcation points in the psychedelic renaissance is how these medicines are going to be used. Are we looking to help people actually be uh, rehabilitated and reconciled with their core wounding to create a more whole human, a more or more in love with life, whole human, ready to give back in service to the glory and the privilege that it is to be in a body? Or are we looking at ways to continue to leverage this cool, sexy, psychedelic renaissance for the profit of our shareholders and looking to advent a bunch of new psychopharmaceutical analogs that we can patent Mm. that have potential questionable efficacy rates? We have a lot of good medicines as it is. I don't know that we need to necessarily go go around continuing to try and recreate the wheel. Yeah. You know, just because that's a capitalistic orientation of our current system. And so I'm not necessarily answering these questions as it is. I'm just wanting to propose these questions to everybody because yourself and your audience are are going to continue to be educators and advocates of their own truth as it relates to psychedelic therapies. And these are the kinds of questions to ask. Like, like when you were 10 years old and you, and you, you realized you were in a monkey suit and you're like, wow, how did I get here? You know? And if you had the opportunity to just be asked the kind of questions, like, where do you think you came from? Mm. How do you feel about being in the monkey suit? You know, <laughs> how do you, yeah. And you just like explore it, get into it. Yes. And so asking these kinds of questions helps to create the dialogue about how to how to move forward with these really powerful tools in the best way possible 
Yeah, I mean, you know, even just that, you know, that idea that you mentioned before, you know, if we could just move the uh, conventional approach to that self-investigative approach, you know, that instead of, oh, you're anxious, take this. It's, you know, we can still give you this, but when is your anxiety worse than, and when is it not as bad? Oh, it's, it's worse when it's at work. What goes on at work? Oh, you've got a tyrannical boss. Oh, <laughs> so, you, you know, it's that self-investigative approach is so much more. And, you know, the, 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 I suppose the part that you mentioned as well is it's reclaiming those fragment aspects of the self, you know, as, a, as opposed to continuing to see yourself as this, you know, um, clunky, fragmented uh machine that doesn't work you know it's well this is who you had to be when you were young in order to get love from that parent so you can understand why your authenticity just skewed off to the left a little bit here you know and mm. I, I love i love i love that dan mate um thanks so much for the show i, I understand you, you you've got to uh we've got to get you out of here but um mm. so great to talk my friend and um so i'm as i said i'm i'm about to a fifth of the way through the, a dose of hope and um i'm really looking forward to finishing it so thanks so much for writing it yeah. Yeah. You're very welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Um, I get the sense that we could go on for hours and maybe days. Yeah. And uh, I also get the sense that you're up to amazing work yourself. So just many, many thanks for everything that you're doing and sharing the good word and things like a dose of hope. Um, I expect we'll continue to reach people in, in a good way to stimulate conversations. Mm. Um and we're going to be doing that at Kuya. And uh, we're going to continue to be as a community of investigators and advocates for this work, um, develop this new paradigm in, in a co-created process, hopefully doing as much as we can to kind of coming back to where we started, bridging the science with the spirituality, mm. the science of the soul. Yeah, fantastic. Um, just very quickly, Dan, uh, where can people find you and how can people, um, grab a copy of the book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a number of websites. The first primary, the, the one that's most relevant likely is Dr. Dan Engel, D-R-D-A-N-E-N-G-L-E.com. And a dose of hope is, uh, on Amazon, geez, I think it's a, with a variety of distributors at this point. Um, we have a splash page floating around somewhere. Um, it just went live pretty s recently, so I'm not sure if our splash page is, is live, but it's fairly easy to find. Yeah, I jumped on it pretty quickly. I may have, I may have actually pre-ordered it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, happy to continue to stay in touch with all that you're up to. And uh, yeah, it'd be great. It's up to work. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, mate, thanks so much for the show. Um, and uh, guys, uh, speak to you next week.